All right. Well, this uh, little Red Ranger here, this is a story I like to tell. Um, at the time, whenever I did this job, this was a, was a brand new truck. And that was back in the day when they used to, uh, whenever you got a cell phone, they put it in, in the vehicle. Car phone. A lot of times, you know, back in the uh, mid-90s, a lot of the, the uh, Ford vehicles, Crown Victoria's Explorers would come with a phone. It was kind of like a bag phone, but it was a console. And, uh, they were kind of ahead of their time on that thing because you could push a little rubber button up here on the A-pillar. There was a microphone there, and it would say, it would, the radio would kick on and say phone, and it would say name, please. And you could say, call Charlie, and it would go beep, 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 and you were talking hands-free. That was in 1995. Well, anyway, this right here, this little Ranger right here, was fresh out of the cell phone installer shop. You know, they basically mounted it down there on the transmit. You know, there was a, one in the old Crown Victoria that y'all are working on out there back in the day. But anyway, and uh, well, the deal was the fuel pump fuse was blown, and when a new fuse was installed, it popped again as soon as the ignition was turned on. You seen that happen? Wasn't that fun how they, last week we found that one missing fuse? <laughs> she worked and worked and worked on that. I think Nick was involved in that too. But one, that one missing fuse. It wasn't blown. It just wasn't there. You know, you can get in trouble like that too. You know. the first that the time I ran into that. that huh? Is that the fuse that's popping on mine? No, the fuse that was, it was the one in the trunk back there in the PDC. All of that crap that wasn't working right on that Dodge. When we got to look at it, all the fuses, one of them wasn't there. And when we put it in, everything started working like it was supposed to. It is really interesting. Well, I said the, the fuel pump fuses. No, no, no. Yours is a starter fuse. Yours is the one that. Because it says start slash fuel. Yeah, no, but when you turn it on, when you try to start it, it goes pop, you know. So you got an electrical short there. Uh, but it doesn't do it every time. Well, a new fuse was installed, you know, we're checking it like that. So uh, this is the layout of Penny's. It looks familiar, like our little Ranger we got out there, out here. But it shows the location of the blown fuse and the fuel pump relay. There's the fuel pump relay. And there's a fuel pump fuse. See, there on the corner of the fuse panel. And so what we did was the shorted socket. We got this little uh, LED, and it glows green. I had a little test light that I sort of put together there, you know. So yeah, it glows green when it's checking ground. It glows red when it's checking power. And this is sort of like a logic probe, but uh, it doesn't have two wires going to it like most logic probes. It's got one and a two two color LED. I put that. I made that happen. But anyhow. Uh, even with a circuit with no short, the low pump, fuel pump will provide a pass of ground. So if, even if we have, we're checked sometimes to see if the fuel pump is good, like we did when that with it, uh, Hudson was working on there. Uh, we found a short the ground, so we can unplug connectors along the current path. So what we did was, we uh, here's the schematic with the test light in there. What we basically want to do is we want to take the fuel pump out of the circuit so that we can see if we've still got a short. We should not have a short right there if there's no fuel pump plugged in, right? So if you take the fuel pump out of it, all right, C309 was uh, the connector that we disconnected to do that. You know, right here? See that connector right there? All right, we can also whack the inertia switch and let it open up and see if it's still there. All right, so we found this connector right here. Let's, let's find this uh, C309 here. Well, C309 is under there. It's coming out through the floor pan, going back here to the fuel pump. So what we did was we unplugged this and it, you know, inertia switch. The short was between these two connectors. So when we unplugged this, we still had a short. So we plugged that back in and then we unplugged this. I'm excuse me, and the short went away is what it amounted to. And so uh, about six feet. In other words, what we determined with our troubleshoot was it was between that connector and that one, one way or another. So if we got a ground right here, and we unplug that one and it stays, and we unplug that one and it goes away, we know it was between that one and that one. And that one's in above your right foot when you're sitting in the passenger seat. And so the big harness with the fuel pump wire between there, uh, it, it, it disappears beneath the carpet. Notice the position of the cell phone there. See that cell phone? All right. That guy had run a screw through the wire harness when he mounted the cell phone. And he was popping the views. So here's the drill hole of the damage and the sheet metal screw sliced through the insulation. That's where it cut it. And it was going right in the metal and it carried the current to the ground and pop goes the fuse. And that, that pink wire with a black stripe is feeding the fuel pump. And you can see where it kind of went in there, you know. Uh, so we called the tow truck. Alright, and the fob was in up now. The little 
key fobs wouldn't work after that. So another problem that developed at the cell phone shop was that the door locks became inoperative, either with the fob or the button. So what are we going to do about that? Now, so here's your uh, RKE schematic. Uh, I found that the terminals 12 and 20 in the RKE module was supposed to have battery voltage. And so there's your, see there's 12 and 20 right there. There's all two fuses. There's two fuses that are feeding that. On at least same truck, if you're looking at the turn signal, there's supposed to be two fuses feeding the turn signal. Um, you know, too hot to the turn signal flashing. All right, here's your wrap module for uh, remote anti-theft personality. If you ever see one of those, you see that number up there? That is the actual, even if it doesn't have a keypad on the door, that is the little keypad number that they would use if they, if they did have a keypad. And so one day somebody was saying on their uh, truck, they said, I don't have the keypad number for my truck ever since I bought it. I just looked under there on the mat when it was up above the uh, park brake and I looked under there and I gave them a five-digit number. Ta-da, they had it then. All right, so checking 12 and 20, I had, my, I had to took to a different schematic. And I looked at terminals 11 and 22, and there's a nice healthy ground. So we're always going to check power and ground when we're looking at that. Once again, this is a little special topic run that I'm doing here. And so there was a nice healthy ground being laid available with each relay. So I moved my test uh, alligator tip from power to ground. I found there was no power coming through the relay poles through the wrap module. And so basically we got issues right there. So I'm basically out with my little light. I should have been able to read power right here. See, so since this provides ground, I unplug it, I'll be able to read power there uh, if that's not grounded. And so, so this relay box is about 10 inches above the accelerator pedal and has a plastic cover that has to be removed to access the relays. There are several relays here. I'll tell you a little bit to find out which one of the relays were locked relays. So I'll pull them out, check for ground signal, deliver the wrap module, and a moment later I realized there was no power to the hot at all times. That's supposed to be always hot. The interior fuse panel, uh, flipped into the power door lock schematic, came from fuse 18, and there was no <laughs> fuse there. Ain't that great? Well, can I help you with something? I don't have a lot of time. Talk to me. Yeah, I'm in class right now. Oh, I didn't know you were in a class. I just want to ask is, uh, how do y'all do, like, if you want to bring it to yeah. Are you enrolled in the college? My son is. Okay. It's his truck. It's actually yeah. sitting right there. Yeah. Uh, well, we, we make a work order request, uh, and then we track it, and it's parked plus 20 percent less tax. When we find out what's wrong with it, you know, if you want it fixed, it'll be parked plus 20 percent plus tax. Okay. Yeah, something going on with the front end. I was going to see if, if y'all could, could put it on the thing and, mm -hmm. and see what's yeah. what's wore out, what's bad, what I, what needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Let me get through the here, and I'll then we'll talk about it. Okay. All right. But anyway, but that fuse number 18 was not even there. Okay. And that's what we wound up with on that. One time, we were out there working on one man, uh, my helper, and uh, the helper that I had with me then. That's a little quick thing. And the helper, this, this helper, you know, we were moving stuff around out there, and uh, we wound up in a situation where uh, he had pulled a fuse and put it back somewhere else. Now, the first time I ever run into a missing fuse situation, you know, we have a tendency to check the fuses that are there to see if they're blown, but you got to look. And you remember what we did on that one the other day? I said, I see a terminal on both sides here, and it looks like there's supposed to be a fuse there, but they're not one, you know. Now, there was another situation I ran into where there was a uh, 47, uh, no, I'm sorry, a 97 uh, Nissan, it wasn't an Altima, it was a uh, Maxima, I think it was, or something. But anyway, um, as I remember, it's been a while back. Uh, but it was over at the at a shop in uh, the town up the road, and it was a hard to start. It spin, 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 spin when it's cold. It's really hard to start. Now, what do you need when you're cold? How many of you guys have drove a vehicle with a carburetor on it? If you got a carburetor on it, what do you got to do? What's the first thing you got to do before you ever spin it over? Choke. Hit the gas. Set the choke, right? So when you hit the gas, you're doing more than setting the choke. What else are you doing? Getting the spark plug right here. You're squirting two, you're squirting gas in there. The accelerator pump goes and squirts gas, right? Okay, so just because an engine has a fuel injection, instead of a carburetor, doesn't mean that you don't need that extra gas when you're starting, right? So I got to thinking about this thing. They'd already put an engine controller on it and all kinds of stuff over trying to figure out what would start. They just work and work and work. And I called, I, they, they said, can we bring this over to you? Because the lady was enrolled up here in computer science. And I said, yeah, you can bring it over here. And so 
She said, I want you to talk to the guy. And he said, well, I've done this, 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 and this, and I put an engine controller on it, but it wouldn't work. And so I took it back off and all that kind of stuff. And I think he charged her like $500 for what he had done or something like that. So I said, okay, let me just think about this for a little bit and, you know, hash it out of my mind, you know, because those sometimes you got to hold it. So I, I got to thinking, I says, now, uh, if I'm spinning it over and it's not starting, but it's finally it'll start up and then it runs good for the rest of the day. So when she starts it again cold the next morning, she still got trouble, right? But we weren't pulling any codes, right? We had no codes whatsoever. Does that get you irritated when you don't have any codes? Now you want a code, don't you? You want to go, you want to pull a code and you want to change the sensor and you want to say it's fixed. All you got to do is think a little bit. I says, I wonder if this thing is actually giving it the double pulse of the injectors when it's spinning over. Back in the day, you said a cool start injector, and it would spray extra gas in there. You got it? This one here, they got smart, and they said, why don't we just double pulse the injectors we already got? And so I said, all right, so I'm going to go over here to get my test light. I'm going to say, is there a, which wire is supposed to be hot when I'm turning it to crank? Because that's the one that's going to tell it that you're spinning it over. So I go over there, and I touch that uh, pin 21, I think it was, and I turn it on, I got nothing. So I go back over here to the wiring schematic, and I look at that, which a lot of people, for some reason, other when I'm teaching them, they don't want to look at the wiring schematic, they just want to wing it, you know what I'm saying? So I look at the wiring schematic, and I track back over here, and I said, wait a minute, that's going through a fuse. So I go to the fuse panel, and the fuse that goes to the start was not there. That little start feed to the computer. <coughs> I put a fuse in there and it went, yeah. that's all I needed it was a fuse. Okay. All right. There was another one that we had that was a 99, and this wasn't a fuse problem, but it was a 99, uh, kind of like a Cavalier uh, Malibu, I guess it was. And a lady said she'd had it all over uh, up there trying to get work done to get it to run it because it was like out of a potato and exhaust pipe. Uh, and uh, so she says, I think $2,000 she spent on it. You know, I don't know what all they did. But they brought it over here and said, you know, this is the last time anybody's going to work on this thing before I trade it in if somebody, if y'all don't get it figured out. So the first time we'd ever seen it, you know, so I bring it in. And um, we checked the exhaust to see if it was stopped up, you know, which, you know, checking the pressure in there and it wasn't stopped up. And, we looked at mass airflow, we looked at fuel pressure, everything was beautiful on that thing, but it wouldn't pull your hat off. I feel like it just was really anemic. Uh, like that stuff. So I'm sitting there saying, well, we got to, and then I said, wait a minute, we're teaching transmissions this time, and they need to know how to check the transmission fluid on one that don't have a dipstick, and this is one of those little 340 E's or whatever it was, it has a little filler cap, like the Cavalier over at D-Tech, <coughs> but there's a little, uh, pipe plug under here, you take out, engine running, engine warm, you're supposed to take that pipe plug out, and you're supposed to see if your screw driver will find cool, uh, I mean, uh, transmission fluid in there. And I said, so we'll get ready to do this. And so I got under, engine running, engine warm. I said, this is how you check the transmission fluid on one of these, and all that. And so I, we took the plug out, and about two quarts of fluid right now. And whenever the fluid went running out, we got it where I could just touch it a bit and put it back in. I said, that's a heck of a lot of fluid to have it overflow, because I guess I might figure like too much is better, not enough, so I just dump a bunch in there without doing the proper check procedure. Most of the time, what happens, what happens usually when you overfill a transmission? It pukes out the vent and goes all over the road. Or if you're sitting here on a really hot summer day with your vehicle in drive, a long time in the drive through you can sit there long enough where it'll start to that fluid will get hotter and hotter and hotter and starting to percolate out the vent and make, you'll see transmission fluid dripping out from other people's car because they had to drive and all the heat and all that transmission is made where? In the torque converter. The torque converter is shearing that fluid and making the heat. So best to put it neutral unless you're pulling up, right? Anyway, that ain't the way this one works. If you overfill this one on fluid, it chokes it down where it won't really go anywhere. So with all the fluid drained out, we drove it in there like a new car. So she just played a, paid a basic charge, and she was a happy camper. Well, it gets better. My son Matt was driving a car that he had inherited from his wife when they got married, and he gave her the nice car, and he was driving the crappy car. You know, I thought that worked. And, and so I said, uh, he said, Dad, he said, I stopped by, and of course he used to work in a tire store and all that, and he did oil changes and all that. We figured, you know, he had some money. 
let them change it all. So anybody shop over they changed it all. He said, ever since I got my car back from the oil change place, it won't hardly pull your hat off. He said, it's terrible. It runs awful. And all I had was an oil change done. And I said, well, I they probably poured some transmission fluid in there that it didn't need. And so he took it home in his little shop. He jacked it up. He put stands under it. He got under it and followed the procedure. I told him to check the fluid. About a quart and a half fluid ran out. So he put the plug back in there after the quart and a half fluid ran out. It's the engine running, transmission warm. This is drive line now. Think about it. And when he drove it, it ran just like it was supposed to. So he goes back and tells the guy that runs the shop, he says, well, you put fluid in my car. You know, so, oh, well, it, it needed some. How did you know it needed some? There's no dipstick. <laughs> I mean, think about that, you know. I mean, just take that cap off and just dump something in there and charge him for some fluid. <laughs> so, but anyway, remember that. If you've got one of those little, you know, late, uh, I mean, if, if it doesn't have a dipstick and it's got that little cap on it where you pour fluid in it, you know, there's a really good possibility if it, if it will barely run that somebody's pouring some fluid in there and didn't need so the whole thing is don't make anything harder than it needs to be. And what are you supposed to do before you pull the water pump off? What's the first thing you're supposed to do? Drain the coolant. Drain the coolant. Drain the coolant. What happens if you don't drain the coolant? It goes everywhere. It goes all over the floor. Now, hey, Denise. Well, it's not a good time oh, to yes. catch them because I thought you were looking around yeah, for it. I'm finishing up. Go ahead and uh, go ahead and make that this happen. This is 133. This is 133. Yeah. Yeah, we, to, uh, we got a pretty good bunch. Everybody in here is in 133. Okay, now you told me for 281, I need to come on the Thursday. That works. I can do 281 today, too. Oh, this is the same student? Yeah, except he's not doing 281, but everybody okay. else is. All right, well, I'll Everybody in here except Noah's doing 133, but he's, he's not doing 281. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right.